Man overboard. And that's when I grabbed the hook knife and did basically every solo sailor's worst nightmare. Cut the jack line. And I had to, because if I didn't, I was going to drown anyway. This isn't a drill, this is the real thing. Falling overboard, every sailor's worst nightmare. But what if you fell into three meter swells in shark infested water and you were the only person on board? What are your chances of survival? What are the mental implications? Could you have prevented it? And could you return to the boat after such a traumatic ordeal? There are so many questions to this scenario and we're here to answer them with the help of Nigel Fox, man overboard survivor, who was rescued off the Arafura Sea of Northern Australia. We should at this point thank Nige for talking to us because this event happened only in January and invariably there were some long-term mental implications to this ordeal. And of course, there are many lessons that we as sailors can learn from this experience. After Nige's wife died of cancer, he decided the best way to heal and to go through the grieving process was to sail. He bought his Nigel Duncanson 34 sloop sailing yacht Bison. Having sailed up the east coast of Australia into the demanding seas of the Torres Strait and west to Darwin, his plan was to sail to Asia. But after the pandemic hit, he revised his plans and decided to turn back and spend some time in the Great Barrier Reef. We'll let Nige set the scene. Yeah, well, it'd been um, absolute shit of a sail from Darwin. There's like five different sides. You've got to basically get in unison to get out. You've got to get them all correctly in time, otherwise you're going backwards. There's a constant like four knot current that goes east to west, basically along the top of Australia. I had to wait for the mon northern monsoon to kick in, leave it for a couple of weeks to sell it, set in, and basically reverse the, the current and obviously the winds. I mean, the weather conditions were basically dreadful. Um, it was all two to three meter swells the whole way. They were generally about it was all at about 120 degrees off one port or starboard quarter of aft, aft, plus the wind. So I couldn't get to it, couldn't even do a true wing on wing. So, I mean, the whole sail across was nasty. And when I got to the vessel, so I would have normally dropped the hook and gone back through the hole in the wall, which is one of those kind of must do things. But the weather was so bad, it was basically the length of the Wessel Islands was just the natural storms. I'm coming up to it and all I can see is basically horizon and horizon clouds and just lightning. That was it. Some of you may be questioning why Nige left when he did. Well, if you don't know it, Northern Australia can be pretty tough sailing. I spoke to Lee of Santorini and Lee and Jason had done the trip the other way. And Lee actually said it was the toughest sail that they have ever done. Mm. So we can't really question when Nige left. I think he left at the right time after mm. the monsoons changed. Of course, he had his Iridium Go, so he was getting 24 hour weather updates and he was logging his passage with his friend Ian in Melbourne. Nige mentioned the hole in the wall, which is known as the Gagari Rip, which would have saved him going around the Cape of the Wessel Islands and shaved off around 60 nautical miles from his journey. But this is a narrow rocky passage with confused seas. So under the conditions he was in, it made sense to avoid it. So he logged his revised plans with his friend Ian, turned to port and went up the west side of the Wessel Islands. It was night time and the wind was reaching 40 knots and there was an electrical storm directly in front of him. So as he rounded the tip of the Wessel Islands, he put the engine on. Now at this point, it was really getting up. The winds were getting up, the swell was getting up. He was being buffeted by the waves. So he got something to eat. He knew he needed to get something inside him immediately. But that was when the problems really began to start. Got everything tidied away, got it back on course. Somewhere in the process, I think getting back into the cockpit, um, I got thrown in and that did two ribs. So I've gone up round the vessels overnight. The following morning, went to start furling the head sail and the furler jammed. And somehow the foresight head sheet managed to wrap itself around the lower cable with the stainless steel staunchions and tied itself in a knot. I think we've all been there. When things go wrong, they come in threes. And Nigel at this point had mentioned that he was starting to get fatigued and this is not to be underestimated. As you know, when you're tired, you can make bad decisions or worse still, not make a decision at all. 
So Nigel had done the right thing by grabbing a bite to eat at the appropriate moment, but with a twisted furling line, things were starting to get bad and they were going from bad to worse. Anyway, I've set the bearing, got my gear on, so I've put on a pair of shorts, shirt, life jacket, look, obviously jack line, clipped on. And uh, as I'm stepping out of the cockpit, there was literally another set of swell, and I don't know if you've seen this yourself, uh, another set of swells quite literally coming into it, 90 degrees to the primary step which were coming in behind me. And they're doing about twice the speed. What Nigel is describing here is cross seas. This is where you get two bodies of ocean meeting, which creates a crisscross pattern of swells. And it's most common around capes, which makes sense considering Nigel's location at this point. Yeah, we saw these when we were crossing from the Andaman Sea into the Indian Ocean when we were heading towards Indonesia. Uh, they were absolutely nothing like Nigel's conditions at all, but they did make for confusing seas and they were quite difficult to sail in. In Nigel's scenario, these seas were dangerous and as we're about to find out, they spelled disaster. That came in and basically hit the boat, beam on, and of course this is an old IRC design boat, so she's got the big fat belly on her. Bang! It's just put her on a beam end. Uh, it just flipped me clean over the stanchions. Next thing I know, I'm like, I'm on the other side going, what the fuck? The good old jack line, being what it was, wrapped itself around my right leg, get the knee. That caused tension, a length of jack line, just perfect length to hook over to the stanchions and hold me that sort of angle, head and shoulders down on the wrong side of them. So every time she went for a wave, of course it pushed my head and shoulders underwater. And I'm in a two to three meter swell and drown, drown, drown. Obviously you don't want to be in that position for too long before self-preservation kicks in and that's when I grabbed the hook knife and did basically every solo sailor's worst nightmare cut the jack line and I had to because if I didn't I was going to drown anyway regardless so I cut the line as it dropped me into the water actually I had, had hold of the tow rail on my left hand I threw the hook knife um, back into the cockpit my right hand and worked my way around the, to the back of the boat oh my god horrible, sickening. I would have been sick to the teeth. I mean, yeah. you can't, can't even begin to imagine what that must have been like, what was going through his head at the time. And of course, to make matters worse, uh, he's in a four knot current, a very strong current. Mm. And he was all alone, all on his own. Fortunately, Nigel has a hydrovane, which is a self steering mechanism mounted to the back of the boat. So with one hand clasping the tow rail, uh, he made his way around to the back of the boat and he grabbed the hydrovane. But don't forget, of course, that the boat is moving up and down like this in the horrendous seas and uh, it made it very difficult. So when he grabbed hold of the hydrovane, he looked up to size up his escape. And this is when his nightmare was about to be realised. And I'm like, only I can do this. And then boom, bloody life jacket self inflated. Oh, no. And the drag from the bloody life jacket dragged me off the sodden boat. And I'm just like going, oh, that's fucked. <laughs> just like, really? I mean, you've got to admire the man for being able to laugh about it now. I should think it was very different at the time. As he watched his boat disappear completely from view with his cat, Stinky, the only person on board. I can't imagine. And to make matters worse, he had had his handheld VHF clipped on to his life jacket, but when it inflated, he thinks that the handheld had got caught around the hydrovane and had ripped off, so he lost that too. Fortunately, he didn't lose his PLB, his personal life beacon, and he was able to clip it onto the back of his net with the antenna upwards, leaving both his hands free. We're going to talk about the PLB in a little bit more detail in a moment because it is the crux of the story. By the way, if you like this story or any other content we put out, please do consider supporting us. We're on Patreon and we have FTB mates as well. And if that doesn't float your boat, then just hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel as well. We return to Nige who talks about his personal life beacon, which essentially saved his life. Uh, with the Ocean Signal PLB, here in Australia, to fit Australian regulation, it gets its own little life jacket, uh, so it can float. Obviously, primarily, if it's just a unit on its own, it don't, you know, homie don't float. But eventually, you just kind of settle down, and I actually found, um, I adjusted the 
uh, leg straps, which bizarrely enough, when you adjust the, your legs up, pulls your feet up, but it actually turns you facing into the waves. So I was like, oh, okay, hands underwater, because up here it's it really is thick with tiger sharks. Sorry, did he just say tiger sharks? They got about five, six meters, like the teeth have evolved to bite through turtle shells. Primarily they are a nocturnal hunter, but even so, I kept my hands underwater, sculling, and just kept my head basically uh, the back of my head to the waves. Sea Survival 101, keep your head to the back of the waves and your hood up. A life jacket without a hood in these conditions could spell disaster. The primary thing with a hood is secondary drowning. And if you're out in that sort of sea with, without a hood, or you're just in a regular life jacket, water ingestion will, over time, slowly drown you. And of course, there's a triple layer of nasty here because not only is salt water corrosive to your lungs, as it's drowning you, it's actually dehydrating you at the same time. Okay, so he's in two meter swells. He's almost drowned. He's lost his boat, he's lost his cat. He's dehydrated. He's got broken ribs. He's got broken ribs as well. Oh my God. I mean, you just, he has got his PLB. The one thing he's got going for him, Obviously, he's still got his uh, life jacket on and his PLB is working. How on earth do you deal with that? Yeah, well, I asked him this actually. I was, I was curious to know, at that point in time, what was his primary concern? Mm. Keeping quiet, or uh, acoustically uh, quiet in the water, trying to keep him back in my head to the wave so I don't uh, suffer from secondary drowning. You've just got to put all the negative thoughts away. There was a mental uh, preservation there. There was something that kicked in that stopped you from uh, thinking the worst of the situation, I suppose. But how were you thinking when, when the boat was disappearing? You know what? It went back quickly. I barely noticed it. Really? The, the, boat, was doing, the boat was doing six and a half knots. She was gone like a bullet from a barrel. And your view from down there at water level actually isn't that good. So you don't get to see the boat for long, it's gone. Mm. And at that stage, I just quite literally mentally just written it off. With the boat having disappeared over the horizon and now floating in shark infested waters, how did he survive? What happened to his boat? And possibly even more importantly, what happened to Stinky the cat? In the next episode, we're going to be discussing his rescue by the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. 4th of January this year, the EMS Response Centre responded to the activation of a personal locator beacon about 100 kilometres north of Gove in the Northern Territory. Upon activation, we identified that the locator beacon was registered to a yacht and we could see the yacht was heading in one direction and the beacon was stationed in another, suspecting to us that there may have been a person overboard from a yacht.